and then d of b i, and then phi tilde b i. And you'll notice there's no more integral here because by taking the product of a bunch of exponentials, this turns, in, I can replace the product over these exponentials with the exponential of the sum, right? So the product d i exponential phi tilde b minus b i, some operator b phi tilde, uh, sorry, phi tilde of b i. This is equal to the exponential of, I, I dropped the minus sign, but it doesn't matter who's arguing, the sum over p i. Right? And as you discretize the theory finer and finer, this sum just turns into the integral we have here. Okay? But the point is, now I have this product of a bunch of independent Gaussian integrals. And I assume you guys remember how to do Gaussian integrals. <clears throat> if you don't, I'll just remind you very quickly. So if you have an integral dx e to the minus a x squared, does anybody remember the answer to this minus infinity to infinity? pi over a with the square root. Yep. So that means we have the product pi we have the product of a uh, bunch of square roots of pi um, and then we have 1 over the square root of pi squared plus m squared. So what is this? This is the product of all the eigenvalues of the operator d, right? Because this is the operator in momentum space. The operator in momentum space is diagonal. So we're just taking the product of all the diagonal elements. What is that? That's otherwise known as which? The product of the eigenvalues if the operator is diagonal is the determinant. So this is up to some normalization, one over the square root of the determinant of our operator d. So that's the, the important piece to remember. And if you had a complex scalar field theory instead of real, you'd have a phi and a phi star, which you could write as phi 1 and phi 2, and do the same thing. And instead of having a 1 over square root of the operator, you'd have 1 over the determinant of the operator. OK. Any questions? Right. So what about fermions? That's the, you have to make sure you understand that every fermions in order to do lattice QCD. Fermions are fun. They seem more complicated, but they're actually easier. They're numerically more complicated, but in some ways, uh, path integrals of fermions is easier than path integrals of bosons. <coughs> So, uh, what do we need to remember? So, fermions are described by Grassmann numbers, right? So, very basic Grassmann algebra. Here's everything you need to know about Grassmann algebra uh, to do what we want to do. If you have a b, this is equal to minus b a, right? The definition. Uh, for A and B, I'll just use G for Grassmann numbers. So then what do you get from that? The other thing you need to know are the integral dB is zero, as opposed to depending on B. The integral of dB B is one. That's something else that's important to know. So what does that mean? If you take the exponential of CA, where C is an element of commuting numbers, and A is an element of the Grassmann algebra, 
what is this? This is just 1 plus C A. That's it. Why? Because if you take the second term, it has an A squared. But A times A has to equal minus A times A. The only way that term survives is if it's zero. So every single function has a very simple Taylor expansion. So imagine taking a set of independent Grassmann numbers. Grassmann numbers. So we're going to have uh, A to 1, A to 2, up to A to N. So we have N Grassmann numbers. For every eta i, eta j, the anti-commutator is zero. In case, right? Um, so any function of eta has this very simple Taylor expansion. There'll be some number, a is a real number, plus sum over b i, B, B, uh, sum over I, B I, A to I. Then you can have more complicated sums, say I less than J, so C, I J, A to I, A to J, so on, up to some number Z, A to 1, A to 2, A to N. And that's the entire Taylor expansion of a function. Because anytime you get two of the same, you know it's automatically so this is for A, B, I, C, I, J, all elements of commuting numbers. Okay, so how about differentiation? That's easy too. So if you take the derivative d, d, a to i, Kronecker delta function, delta ij. If you take the partial derivative with respect to grasp a number of a commuting number, you get zero. If you take the product rule, you have to be careful. What do you get? You get delta ik a to j. And the interesting thing, minus delta jk. So the partial derivative also has to anti-commute in the graph of algebra. And then for fun, we can also define the integral. So we can take d a to i, a to j. This is also delta i j. We can take the integral d a to i of a to j a to k. Well, let me just put my indices to be the same. D A to K I J. And this is equal to delta I K A to J minus delta J K A to I. So what do you notice? The integral operator and the derivative operator are actually identical. Right? So that's why fermions are very easy in some sense deal with pass integrals. They're actually, they're very complicated, but uh, in this way, at least conceptually, they're kind of easy once you wrap your head around these anti-commuting numbers. And just for fun, uh, homework two. This one's easier than homework one, so hopefully you guys will do it by the end of the day. So <laughs> homework two, the, uh, the delta function Is simply the difference operator. So show this. Homework two. Okay. Ah, right. The easiest way to show it you can imagine is what you want to do is uh, 
take this aid out. Or, sorry, eta minus eta prime. It shows this is f of eta prime. This is how we define this delta function. Okay. So now, though, what I really want to talk about is thinking about functional integrals of these grasping fields. So getting the fermions of the back integral. So all these rules lead to some very uh, important properties. So now consider. Uh, two n independent Grassman numbers. Okay, so we're going to label them as eta i and eta star i. It's important to remember this is not the complex conjugate of this. These are two different sets of independent numbers. This is that's an i in both cases. For i equals one. The end. So what you can show is d eta star d eta. I'll be, tell you what I mean by this uh, integral here. Times the exponential of minus eta star transpose times some matrix M eta this is equal to the determinant of n. Okay? So remember with real, so already you can see the way I've constructed this, this looks like a discretized theory, right? I have a set of n eta i's and eta j's. This could just simply be my set of the fields over the space time. And now I have some operator. This could be like the differential operator. And now the integral over this set is equal to the determinant of m, which is the inverse, you'll remember, from the scalar field theory. So the scalar field theory had 1 over the determinant of the operator. This has the determinant upstairs. OK, so what do I mean by this, this product integration? This is d eta 1 star d eta 1 d eta 2 star d eta 2 n star d eta n. And the important thing is you have to define a convention because if you flip the order you pick up some minus signs and if n were odd you have an overall minus sign. So you have to be careful just to remember to pick a convention, stick with it, and then you can, uh, everything else follows. Okay. Another property you get, if you take the integral, well, let me just stop writing this out. I'll write it just like I mean in a path integral. You can take, <clears throat> so this, uh, here I'll mean the exact same thing. D eta star D eta. So I'm just using that as a shorthand for this. Uh, product uh, integration. Minus eta star transpose m theta times um, the exponential of some j star transpose m uh, inverse j. So, sorry. I read the wrong line. What I want is I want to put in sources. So then I have exponential j transpose star eta plus eta star transpose j. So put in sources just like we do in the fast interval for the, the real field theory. And you can show this is equal to uh, determinant of m times this exponential. So j star transpose m inverse j. So again, exactly what you expect. Now you have a determinant of m, and then you have this these source terms. You can differentiate with respect to the source terms to get the correlation functions you want. Okay. 
And the last one we want to know is the, what well, is the last one we want to know? So I'll just rewrite that line to look more like QCD. So D side bar, D side, the uh, exponential of minus D4X side bar. some operator D psi, and then uh, plus our sources J dagger psi plus psi bar J. This is, so this is the path integral for the currents J, or the sources J and J dagger. And this is equal to nothing else than the determinant of some operator D times our exponential J dagger D inverse So, using this, I'm now going to tell you why lattice QCD is numerically so demanding. So why are we still talking about, so QCD was invented in what year? Does anybody remember? It was before probably most of you were born. It was invented, uh, let's see, when was the first paper? It was 1970 something. It was a paper by Gelman. Fritz and Lloyd Wheeler. They wrote down the QCD Lagrangian. So by the way, uh, if you want to learn about the history of QCD, you can go to the library and check out the new book by John Collins on foundations of perturbative QCD. The first chapter, he went through the literature and actually figured out the history of how the theory of QCD came about. It's a fun read, but it's not worth a $150 book until you <laughs> have a better paying job. Go to the library, check it out, have it read. So, Gelman, Fritz, and Lloyd Wheeler wrote down the QCD Lagrangian in like 73, 72, I can't quite remember off the top of my head. And then in 1974 was the paper by Pollitzer and Wilczek and Gross where they demonstrated that the QCD beta function was negative. And then, then they knew that this theory satisfied all the properties you needed for Bjorken scaling. So when you look at the deep and elastic scattering off a of proton, what we found, remember, is at asymptotically high Q squared values, the proton looked like the electron was actually scattering off of three point particles, three non-interacting point particles. So this is what a QCD was really believed, okay, this is the right theory most likely, or this is a theory that has the right features. And then it was 1980-something when Wilson wrote down his lattice field theory paper. So the theory of lattice field theory is only a few years older than QCD. But we're still talking about lattice QCD today. So the question is why? And I'm going to tell you why. So this is the fermion determinant, or the fermion path integral. So here, let's write down the QCD path integral without any sources, just for short. So what do we have to do? We have to integrate over the quarks and the anti-quarks. We have to integrate over the gluons. And then what do we have? I'm going to use shorthand here. We have our action. We have minus psi bar D, which depends on A, psi, minus a quarter g squared. Well, this is the gauge field uh, Lagrangian. So, firstly, it's actually very challenging, of course, to code Grassmann numbers into a computer, especially when you want to solve them on a big uh, system. So, like I said, typical state of the art. Today, that is, lattice QCD universes are of order 32 cubed by 64. So this is n l, sorry, n x equals n y equals n z. And for reasons I might talk about, 
usually we take time to be twice as long as space. Uh, so what does that mean? So that means if you discretize this theory and you want to represent this operator as a matrix, you have to turn, transform this four-dimensional space-time into just a column vector. So that means your uh, field side of x is going to be a 32 cubed by 64 by 3 for color by 4 for spin column vector. So this is a vector that is what? This is 12 times 2 million 97,152 sites. So the basic operation in lattice QCD is to manipulate matrices that are this big. So for every single spin color combination, you have a 2 million by 2 million matrix. And that's why lattice QC is hard. Well, that's the start of why lattice QC is hard. And why we're still talking about it. Okay, so what do you do? It's hard to do Grassmann numbers on the computer, so the very first thing you do is actually perform the Grassmann integration by hand. And so the QCD theory becomes an integral over just the blue, and then you have the determinant of this operator D which depends on the blue, times just the gauge action. Okay? Well, so what do we have to do? That means for every single configuration of blue, we have to know what this matrix is. And we want n, say, order a thousand different sets of a. So we have to come up with an efficient way to evaluate the determinant. Okay? Now the reason I talk about scalar field theory is because there's a trick, the most common trick to actually evaluate the determinant is to not evaluate the determinant, but introduce pseudo-fermions. What do I mean? So pseudo-fermions, you introduce some bosonic degrees of freedom to represent your fermions, and then the path integral becomes the integral over the blue integral over phi star, integral over phi, exponential, we have the gauge action, and then we add to this minus phi star transpose d inverse phi. Okay? So that's what, that's the most common way to do, to handle uh, the fermion determinant. And so, you see, if these are bosonic degrees of freedom and you do the integral exactly because it's Gaussian, you end up with, so the d phi star d phi uh, e to the minus phi star d phi. This is 1 over the determinant of d inverse, which is 1 over the determinant of d inverse, which is the determinant of d. So this is the trick we use to solve this uh, determinant. But what does that mean? That means you have to be able to very efficiently take the inverse of a very large sparse matrix with small eigenvalues. So do any of you play video games? Anyone? It's, a, it's okay to admit you play video games. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Video games are driven by graphics, and graphics need matrix manipulation, which has led to the invention of these graphics processing units, GPUs, which are in all your Xboxes or all your computers these days. And those are very, very good at in, uh, manipulating large matrices. And so your uh, enjoyment for playing video games and watching movies drives the industry to produce these very good GPU cards, and those are used, actually, state-of-the-art lattice calculations almost all use graphics cards. In fact, the very first one was somebody took a bunch of Xboxes, stuck them together, and did lattice QCD calculations back in the early 2000s. So, okay. So, now, 
this, this is getting to the heart of why is lattice QCD so hard. Because what we need to do is take the inverse of a very large sparse matrix where every single, remember this is a matrix that depends on AU because we still have an integral over the blue we have to do. So we have to be able to perform this integral many, many, many times. So this inverse many times. Now, how does the CPU time scale to compute the inverse of some operator? Well, it turns out the CPU time scales as what's in something known as the condition number, which is the ratio of the maximum eigenvalue to the minimum eigenvalue. So in QCD, what are the eigenvalues of QCD operator? Well, you may recall from studying features of QCD, uh, the up and the down quark masses are very small. So M, U and V, these are much smaller than the typical eigenvalue in the spectrum of the Dirac operator. Okay? And you may also recall the vacuum of QCD spontaneously breaks. And that spontaneous symmetry breaking happens to be related to the zero modes of the operator. So that means within this operator are zero eigenvalues, at least when you consider just the derivative. So what that means is the minimum eigenvalue is set by the quark mass. So what that means is the CPU time scales, so the smallest <coughs> eigenvalues are of the scale of M, U, and V. And because this number is so small compared to lambda QCD, remember I told you it also needs to be small compared to the inverse lattice division. As you try to bring the light quark mass down to the physical value, there's a spike in the amount of CPU power you need just to compute this inverse. So there's Problem one, but that's actually the easiest problem because there's these new techniques which basically make this sort of uh, mitigated. Remember, the universe also, the CPU time also will depend on the volume of the universe, right? So the volume of the universe is going to be L over A approximately to the fourth power. So let me just say CPU time for V and V. And then if I restore dimensionless lattice units, this is 1 over A M cubed. And then for reasons I won't go into at all, the algorithms typically have an extra penalty that goes like 1 over A. And so if you count the powers of the lattice space and you see that this scales like 1 over A to the sixth power. So this is actually, is absolutely horrible, right? This is the optimal case. If you want to do finite temperature, it turns out that goes more like A to the 9, okay? So what does that mean? For A to the 6, if you want to make A go to 1 half A, you pay 64 times the original CPU time, right? But in order to show that we've recovered QCD, you have to have several lattice spacings. So the growth in computing time, just to demonstrate this, is tremendous. So that's why only today, with the deployment of these new computers that are in the petaflop scale, have we finally been able to perform numerical calculations that can be compared with the experiment. And so this is part of the reason why you happen to be living in an exciting time if you're interested in nuclear physics and lattice QCD because lattice QCD has just now gotten to the point where you can start to actually do interesting physics with lattice QCD. So for high energy physics, like heavy quark physics, fine and cam physics, that was five, six years ago when it started to become very relevant. For our reasons I won't go into, nuclear physics is exponentially more difficult, and so it's only today that it's starting to happen. And so if you happen to like computers and you happen to like nuclear physics, this is an absolutely excellent time to get into the field. You're going to do very wonderful, amazing things. And all your friends will be jealous, except they'll spend like three years working on two papers. <laughs> They're very frustrated. OK. Uh, particular rock uh, explanation why the 